Hi everyone, welcome to the Billy Wilder Theatre. I'm Claudia Bester, I'm the Director of Public Programs here at the Hammer Museum. Director Joan Singleton passed away suddenly in April at age of 51, and his death is a major cultural loss for cinema. He showed America a side, a side of itself with unflinching honesty, centering on black people's realities, dreams, and nightmares. We're celebrating Singleton's vision with this short series of films that celebrate his dynamic visions of black life and his pioneering efforts to broaden Hollywood's lens. The series was curated by critic and writer Ernest Hardy, who also co-curated the very well-received series The Black Book here at The Hammer with his colleague Tisa Bryant. Tonight we're screening the 1997 drama Rosewood, set in Florida in 1923. Our series curator, Ernest Hardy, is going to say a little bit about John Singleton and about Rosewood, and then we'll play the film. Ernest Hardy's criticism has appeared in the New York Times, The Village Voice, Vibe, Rolling Stone, The LA Times, and The LA Weekly. He's a contributor to the reference books, A Thousand and One Movies You Must See Before You Die, and Classic Material, The Hip Hop Album Guide. His collection of criticism, Blood Beats Volume 1, Demos, Remixes, and Extended Versions, was a recipient of the 2007 Pen Beyond Margins Award. Blood Beats Volume 2, the, book, the Bootleg Joints, was published in February 2008. Ernest has been a juror for the Sundance Film Festival, the San Francisco International Film Festival, the Palm Springs International Short Film Festival, LA Outfest, and the LA Film Festival, and co-programmed the Fusion Film Festival in Los Angeles. His, eth his essay, Arthur Jaffa's Monstrous Cinema, appears in Jaffa's monograph, A Series of Utterly Improbable Yet Extraordinary Renditions. He has profiled Jordan Peele, Barry Jenkins, and Ryan Coogler for Written by Magazine, and written liner notes for Chuck D. Presents, Louder Than a Bomb, Curtis Mayfield Gospel, Chet Baker, Career, 1952-1988, and the box sets Love Luther, Say It Loud, A Celebration of Black Music in America, and Superstars of 70 Soul, among others. Ernest co-edited the literary anthology War Diaries, which was published in 2011. His short story, Cold and Wet, Tired You Bet, appears in Best Gay Stories 2011, and two of his poems appear in the anthology Black Gay Genius on Joseph Beam and In the Life from 2015. Ernest currently teaches in the Critical Studies Department at CalArts. Please join me in welcoming Ernest Hardy. Thank you for coming out. Rosewood was John Singleton's fourth film, following Boys in the Hood, Poetic Justice, and Higher Learning. The last two had mixed reviews and disappointing box office returns. Rosewood, screenplay by Gregory Poyer, was made for $31 million, Singleton's largest budget up to that point. It was initially considered a prestige film, something that would hopefully garner lots of awards and critical acclaim. The critical acclaim came, but Warner Brothers seemed indifferent to the film when it was released, giving it a lackluster marketing campaign and opening it in far fewer, far fewer theaters than a film of its pedigree would seem to warrant. It never even got an overseas release, going straight to video instead. Based on the true story of the 1923 massacre of a black com community in Rosewood, Florida, the film depicts a world in which free black people not that far removed from slavery now owned land and businesses and were doing better materially than most white folks the next town over. Early in the film, we not only see prosperous black people, but black people standing up to white supremacy without blinking, demanding respect for their personhood. When you research the history of the assorted real-life massacres of free black people in their towns in America, that's a recurring factor. Their independence and prosperity was one of the sparks for the violence inflicted upon them. Zach Cheney Rice, writing about the film Rosewood in New York Magazine in May of this year, gave the following historical context. In 1923, the predominantly black town of Rosewood, Florida, was burned to the ground. White locals had become convinced that a black drifter had raped a white woman and sought vengeance against their black neighbors, killing at least six in as, in as many as 27 of them. And there are some reports that put the death toll much, much higher than that. This was not an isolated attack. Rosewood's fate mirrored that of more than a dozen black communities in the late 1910s and early 1920s during the 73-year stretch of vigilante violence known as the lynching era. 
which claimed at least 4,000 lives from 1877 to 1950. Black sections of Longview, Texas and Tulsa, Oklahoma had been raised by white mobs under similar circumstances in 1919 and 1921, respectively. Both those communities survived their massacres. Rosewood was wiped off the face of the earth. Survivors who fled Rosewood were silent about their ordeal in public until local reporters stumbled over their story in the early 1980s. News and magazine reports followed. National interest grew as the victim's descendants initiated claims, initiated a claims case against the state of Florida for failing to protect their families. They launched a media blitz to draw attention, discussing the killings on news programs and daytime talk shows, including 60 Minutes and The Maury Povich Show. The lawsuit fizzled, but state legislators took up the case, commissioning a study aimed at determining reparations. Between 1994 and 1995, Florida awarded the Rosewood survivors $150,000 each. Nine of them were alive to collect. As I said a few weeks ago in introducing Boys in the Hood, while highlighting the conversation that film had about gentrification, Rosewood illustrates the ways in which land and home ownership have always been fraught undertakings for African Americans, no guarantee of the security and generational wealth building that white Americans have long been able to take for granted. In fact, simply owning land and homes often painted targets on our foreheads. Black American history, along with that of Native Americans, is the core of American history. It has long been a source of frustration for me that the intentional erasing of our history has resulted in the widespread belief that black Americans are lazy, that we have not tried to help ourselves, that we have not done for ourselves. It has resulted in the belief that we haven't forged businesses and communities and been self-sufficient, all of which we have done, and all of which have consistently been met with nonstop racialized terrorism that has shaped and is still shaping our realities. The, the erasure ignores the ingenuity and persistence with which we have fought back. The paving over of black American history means that a lot of people, including tragically a lot of black people, don't know that the blood sacrifices of enslaved Africans and their descendants have made possible the very notion of possibility that America has long claimed is simply there for the taking. There was nothing simple about it. And that lack of historical framework means that the true meaning and impact of the 2008 financial crisis and its decimation of black home ownership are not understood as part and parcel of the ways black America has been exploited and destabilized. It means that the horrifying land grabs that have seen one million black farmers lose their land and livelihoods to shady and racist government and business practices, which are often one and the same, are not put in context as being standard operating procedure in America. As you watch Rosewood and make note of the ways of the way it weaves in a backstory of post-traumatic stress disorder in a black war vet who fought for a country that never recognized his citizenship or his humanity. As you see the ways fear and anxiety around black men violating white women, an anxiety which white women have cruelly and cynically exploited to cover their own asses, while white men had easy access to the bodies of black women, and as it all builds to horrifying violence. I also want you to keep in mind the music and poetry and beauty of black life that have been on display as well. And I want to leave you with two poems by Nicole Seeley, one of my favorite contemporary poets. Um, I've read both these poems at the Hammer before, um, and I keep coming back to Miss Seeley's work because I think it really captures what it is to be a black American. The first poem is called it's not fitness, it's a lifestyle. I'm waiting for a white woman in this overpriced equinox to mistake me for someone other than a paying member. I can see it now. As I leave the steam room, naked except for my wedding ring, she'll ask whether I finish cleaning it. Every time I'm at an airport, I see a bird flying around inside so fast I can't make out its wings. I ask myself, what is it doing here? I've come to answer, what is any of us? And then the next one, the final one, is Historical Strength. And both these are in Miss Silly's book, um, Ordinary Beast, from 2017. Historical Strength. When I hear news of a hitchhiker struck by lightning yet living, or a child lifting a two-ton sedan to free his father pinned underneath, 
or a camper fighting off a grizzly with her bare hands until someone, a hunter perhaps, can shoot it dead. My thoughts turn to black people, the historical strength we must possess to survive our very existence, which I fear many believe is and treat as itself a freak occurrence. So um, I, I won't say enjoy this film because it's, it's, a, it's a hard watch, but it definitely um, pulls back the covers on some history that's been buried. Sorry, the mixed metaphors there are kind of bad. Um, but I do think this is definitely a film worth your time. It shows John Singleton's maturation as a filmmaker. Um, he still can be a little heavy-handed, but um, it's in the service of a, of, a, of a true story that he, for the most part, tells very, very effectively. And I think that um, there will be a lot that you can get from it. Thank you for coming out. <laughs>